Ever heard of colour and coding systems? While these technical terms are of less importance these days, thanks to modern televisions embracing digital technology, it's still interesting to learn about how PAL and NTSC analog signals shaped gaming as we know it today. Hi, my name is Lorne Risley, and I'm going to take you on a brief and hopefully entertaining ride through gaming history. So brace yourselves and hold on tight. Right, so before we can get to the fun stuff, let's first try to understand what colour encoding systems are. Before digital technology became so superfluous, televisions used analogue signals. The brightness, colours and sounds were represented by amplitude, phase and frequency of an analogue signal. The colours in those systems were encoded with one of three colour coding schemes, NTSC, PAL and CCAM. The latter was mostly localised to France, the Soviet Union and parts of Africa. As such, the impact of the encoding system on gaming was very limited. However, PAL and NTSC were widely adopted by the gaming industry. NTSC was developed in America, where electrical consumption is at 60 Hz, and PAL was developed in Western Germany, where power is generated at 50 Hz. And because refresh rates are directly proportional to power consumption, this had a very real and divergent impact on broadcast technology in Europe and the US. Of course, frame rates on analog televisions were exactly half their refresh rates because their screens were interlaced, meaning they skipped every other line on the screen to keep a consistent image. Therefore, American televisions ran at roughly 30 frames per second, while European televisions ran at 25 frames per second. However, one big advantage that PAL offered was that it had higher resolution, 625 lines as opposed to NTSC's 525 lines. Therefore, NTSC became widely accepted in the US, Japan, Korea, Taiwan and South America. Meanwhile, PAL was adopted by territories such as Britain, Australia, Southern Africa, India and China. So finally we get to how this affected gaming. Well, most importantly, any games developed for PAL systems would be incompatible with NTSC televisions and vice versa. As long as games were available for both encoding systems, this wouldn't be a problem. However, just on the PlayStation 2 alone, well over a hundred games were exclusively made for European customers, leaving US gamers out in the cold. And the reverse also held true. Just as many games were made exclusively for the US market. However, with the arrival of 7th gen consoles, this problem went away due to PS3 and Xbox 360 supporting HDMI output for the first time. As long as users had multi-system monitors, they could play NTSC and PAL region games, regardless of their geography. With the Wii, Nintendo still clung to the old restrictions, however, most certainly to prevent uncontrolled import across regions, this could have been circumvented with the use of unsolicited homebrew software. One interesting side note is that PAL games originally ran 17% slower than their NTSC equivalents. This is because instead of skipping frames, developers just slowed down gameplay to prevent micro stutters. A good example of this is the Sonic series on Genesis. Because Sonic is all about speed, the differences in NTSC and PAL versions are more pronounced. Even the music is a little bit slower on the PAL version. It all depended on how developers optimised games for the two encoding systems. The PAL version of Super Mario Kart for the SNES ran just as fast as the NTSC version. Slowdowns with PAL games persisted into the PS2 era. Eventually, developers did manage to get 60 frames out of PAL games, and this issue disappeared as soon as HDMI was widely adopted as a standard. 